Mexico. Its beauty can overwhelm the senses. Its people can warm the soul. Its endless desert landscape, pristine coastlines, and rich heritage serve as a reminder that God's hand is truly at work in this world. Since the long ago days of Spanish exploration, this land has given us so much. From tequila and mariachi bands to cartel violence and Selma Hayek, Mexico has left its unique fingerprint on the world. But in the summer of 1998, it gave us something much, much more. This is that story. I joined the Mexican mini tour in 1990 because quite frankly, I couldn't get status on any other tour. I had just lost my card on the Aleutian Islands tour near the Alaskan Soviet border late in 89 and I just kind of needed a home for my game. The Mexican mini tour was kind of like an answer to my prayers you might say. That elusive second chance. His game was very raw when I first got on his bag. He missed his first 47 cuts on tour. Those were the lean years. I stayed with him because I saw the raw talent and the potential. But he was very lazy. He made very bad decisions on and off the course. And he had a hot temper. It was my job to harness his talent. I couldn't speak the language, which obviously didn't help. You know, sure, I picked up a few key phrases I had to use a lot, like donde hater yo soltar, which, which of course means where do I drop, and este un provisional, which, which means this is a provisional, and, and then of course son tu di diecisete enos antiguo todavia, which, which means are you 17 years old yet? But, but having to adapt to a new culture, I think negatively affected my game, and and let's not also forget that I contracted an STD from a Cabo San Lucas motel mate the very first week I got down there, okay? Now, I'm not gonna sit here and, and blame all of those missed cuts on that, but, but it played a factor. I met CPG back when Craigslist was in its infancy. He promised me if I married him, I'd be hanging out with Justin Leonard's wife in Orlando. He promised me I'd be going to cocktail parties at Jeff Maggart's house. He promised me I would meet Blaine McAllister, okay? He promised me the life of a tour wife, a PGA tour wife. Next thing you know, I look up and I'm living in the back of a PT Cruiser 20 kilometers outside La Paz. The guy's a loser, period. Look, I'll be the first to admit my career didn't take off like I thought it would. You know, I had a poor attitude. I was drinking a lot, you know, I was constantly bitter at the PGA Tour for not recognizing my Oldsmobile scramble record. I felt like they were keeping me off the tour for purely political reasons. It was just a tough time. But all that was about to change. And change it did. Over the next six years, Club Pro Guy went on a run by making eight total cuts, including at the 95 Reynosa Shamble the 97 rain short at Nuevo Laredo shootout, and the prestigious Juarez Masters. Spirits were high midway through the 1998 season when the team arrived in Merida for the Mexican Mini Tours flagship event, the Yucatan Masters. After a disappointing opening round 85, CPG seemed poised to make his move. Yucatan National is very demanding. I told CPG that our game plan should be to stay patient. I felt like if we could make a few solid bogeys early, it would ease us into the round. I told him that we should just take what the course gives us. I had an unbelievable warm-up. 
You know, Ernesto and I spent over two hours prior to my tea time working on punch outs from the woods adjacent to the driving range. We worked on different trajectories and distances and it was just surreal, almost magical. In two hours, I hardly hit a branch. I was just so dialed in. I don't remember a time in my career where I walked to the first tee with more confidence. He was ready. Yes, he was ready. Unfortunately, the optimism didn't last long. CPG double-crossed his opening tee shot out of bounds, deep into a nearby barrio. Devastating. Yeah, it was disappointing. I was like, yeah, whatever. My main concern at that point was walking 6,500 yards in four-inch heels in a micro mini skirts. After going out in 44, highlighted by a penalty on number nine for playing a range ball, CPG and his trusty caddy convened on the 10th tee to regroup. He was very upset and I don't blame him. It was the third time that season we incurred a penalty for playing a range ball. I could see the anger. It was building in him. It was like a fire. We get to 10 T and I'm just absolutely fuming. But at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of clarity and purpose. I look Ernesto straight in the eyes and I, I tell him to get out the scuba gear because we're taking it deep on the back nine. After tough luck bogeys on 10, 11, and 13, what simply became known as the streak began. A wayward drive, punch out, and quality up and down on 14 resulted in par number one. On the difficult par 4 15th, a flushed four iron from 170 yards out to six feet, followed by a great two putt, was par number two. A perfect drive on number 16, followed by a six iron that finished inside the spray painted boundary of a temporary green and course mandated auto two putt resulted in consecutive par number three. The par 5 17th was no match for CPG. After reaching the green in two, a stress free three putt par followed for consecutive par number four. At this point, I'm totally numb. I know what's happening, but, but I really don't want to acknowledge it. I was hoping to lean on Ernesto to keep me grounded, but he just kept saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I was very nervous, this is true. The US kid's staff bag I was carrying felt light as a feather, like I was floating. But I knew there was still much work to be done. The finishing hole at Yucatan National is a formidable challenge. And what a challenge it was. After a patented block dead right off the 18th tee, CPG engineered a masterful little three-finger punch out back into the fairway. However, his flushed nine iron from 120 out fell short of the 18th green and put the streak in serious jeopardy. I was 10 paces short of the green. The pin was, was situated on a shelf and called for a shot with a lot of loft. A mega flop was the only play. He bladed it. How do you say in America? Ginsu? Yes, a knife. He hit it right in the forehead. It was very bad. At the last moment, just before impact, I decided I had no business hitting a delicate flop off of Mexican hard pan. In a split second of indecision, I elected to go with a little low runner with some pace that scooted along the ground. Is he claiming he meant to hit a low runner? He flinched on it so bad. I can still see the people in the Telemex corporate hospitality tent scatter after he made contact. That flag stick saved his in a shot that is still talked about in cantinas and barrios across the Yucatan. CPG's screaming line drive hit the pin dead square and fell in for a par, his fifth straight. I couldn't believe my eyes. Five pars in a row. So happy. Oh my God, I was very happy. I was so content. 
He shot like an 83, okay. He missed the cut by 12. CPG and Ernesto are celebrating like they just won the Tecate Cup. I even think Ernesto took the flag even though they were the first ones out for the day. I mean, I'm glad they were happy and all, but all I could think about was that 16-hour drive we had ahead of us back to Matamoros. With the par streak on hold at five, all eyes turn to the next stop on the schedule, the premier team event on the Mexican mini tour, the Matamoros four ball. For Team CPG, it turned into a waiting game. The Matamoros four ball was six days away. So much time to think, to dream, to wonder. It was unbearable. I feared that it might be too much time. Too much time. Waiting. It seems like that's all we did. If the waiting didn't make things hard enough, the tour made a tough situation even more difficult by assigning CPG with a fresh-faced tour rookie as his four-ball partner, Hans von Richter. Hans was a recent graduate of the Falcon Islands tour and just secured his Mexican mini-tour card. My dad served in Vietnam, so I'm not a huge fan of Germans, but there was way too much on the line to let Hans distract me. Uh, he, Club Pro guy, for some reason, I always thought I was from Germany um, because my name is Hans, but I was born and raised in Michigan. He, he would always call me Schnitzel uh, when he saw me on the range. It was all very strange. Um, I'd never seen a player practice punch out shots so much. Uh, literally three days before the event began, that's all he did uh, was, was practice punch outs. I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. I liked Hans a lot. I thought he was a nice addition to the team. Uh, Brandy was very forward. Um, she would always use air quotes when she would talk about her and CPG being married. Um, she kept asking me if I'd ever seen the cargo space of a PT cruiser. Um, I just felt very uncomfortable. To make an already pressure-packed situation worse, CPG was pulled over by the Federales in his tournament courtesy car and cited for DUI and public nudity the night of the Pro-Am party. Brandy was forced to use all the skills she had acquired in her former life as a dancer in El Paso to get him out of jail in time for his Thursday morning tea time. It was becoming clear to everyone involved that the pressure of the streak might be too much for CPG to bear. He was feeling the weight of the streak. I'm not going to lie, the strain of what I was attempting to undertake was consuming me. Thursday morning finally arrived, and if the pressure was getting to CPG, he didn't show it on his opening tee shot. His roped tow hook found a fair way setting up an easy par on number one, taking the streak to six. That was huge. Opening pars were very rare for us. My goal at that point? to keep him calm and in the moment. As we walked to the second tee, I kept saying to him, don't think about the streak, don't think about the streak. I was singing. Ernesto was my rock. He kept reminding me not to think about the streak. As fate would have it, the entire teeing ground at the par three second hole at Matamoros Country Club had been completely washed out from the recent flooding that had plagued northern Mexico and southern Texas during the previous weeks. The tournament committee placed a temporary tee box 10 yards off the green, making the hole much more gettable for the players. CPG used his chipper to bump a little runner up to four feet, setting up a stress-free two putt running the streak to seven. That was huge. You know, those floods came at a perfect time. You know, that hole usually plays about 150 yards, and, and looking back, it's unlikely I would have parted. This is really the point where I'm starting to wonder if there's a larger power at play here. Some type of divine intervention.
Hey everybody, Club Pro Guy here coming to you live from the Pro Shop. You know, unlike many of you, I haven't been able to feel the joy since 2005 because FootJoy has stubbornly refused to lift my credit hold. But lately, my members have been insisting that I carry their complete line of footwear here in the shop. So I went across town and paid retail for all of these beauties and marked them up $10 a pair. So it's all good. Adam Scott, Justin Thomas, and Club Pro Guy. Wear what the pros wear. How was that? Was that good? Did I sound? Foot joy. Feel the joy. The flooded tea box was a nice break, but I knew our biggest test was ahead. Everyone knew the next two holes were the toughest two holes on tour. Affectionately nicknamed El Chapo's Taint because they are, they are so very nasty. El Chapo's Taint, the hardest two hole stretch on tour. Very few players come out of those holes unscathed. Yeah, I, I know they call it uh, El Chapo's Taint, uh, but both holes are driver flip wedge. Um, to this day, I still don't know what all the fuss is about. Like its more famous counterparts, Amen Corner, the Bear Trap, and the Snake Pit, El Chapo's taint secured its place in Mexican mini-tour lore by derailing more than its share of championship runs. The first leg of El Chapo's taint is a long par four with a giant canyon protecting the left side and the Matamoros municipal dump strategically guarding the right. Finding the fairway here is an absolute must. I told him to play the double cross. It was his most reliable shot. I just told him to remember. Remember the swing thought. Remember the swing thought that reminds him of all his other swing thoughts and just trust it. I wanted to hit a high feathery cut, but Ernesto convinced me that the double cross was the right play. I trusted him. I aimed dead right, directly over the municipal dump right of the fairway and tried to play a cut, hoping for the double cross. In what became known as his go-to shot, CPG unleashed his double cross. Nobody saw it coming. I uh, almost killed a kid. A young boy was seriously injured. Senor CPG's drive hit him square in the head. We heard the impact from the tee. There was so much blood. People forget how hard those top flight magnas were. When we reached him, he was just laying there. We had hoped he was napping. He was, how do you say in English, unresponsive. Oh my God. This poor kid took one right off his dome. It was disgusting. There was blood everywhere. It was really gross. I mean, even though I took a nursing class as part of my GED, I didn't really think there was anything I could do. Not to mention I was double fisted with margaritas and plastic cups at the time. You know, I knew the kid was hurt bad, like, like real bad, potentially fatally bad, but I wasn't about to allow that to sidetrack me. You know, that kid's forehead kept my ball in play, and I, I knew that great players took advantage of great breaks. I signed my glove and laid it on the kid's chest as, as a group of bystanders desperately tried to revive him. You know, I felt like, like that was something he might appreciate and cherish if and when he ever regained consciousness. He gave the kid a glove, which was very nice. But we soon realized that it was our only glove. So I had to go back to get the glove. It was so very awkward. I had to interrupt them doing CPR momentarily so I could grab the glove. 
Looking back, I regret doing that. I regret it. Thanks to what many call divine intervention from that young boy, CPG ended up powering the hole to run the streak to eight. Michael Graham, the brave 10-year-old victim, had been enjoying a vacation with his family and was able to attend the tournament as a reward for making the honor roll at school as well as winning a recent debate tournament. Luckily, Michael survived the ordeal and is thriving today in a Houston-assisted living home. Eight pars in a row. Incredible. I'm not sure whatever happened to that kid, but I'm sure he would agree he contributed to something very special that day. With the par streak now at eight, all eyes were on the tee shot on the par four fourth hole, the vaunted second leg of El Chapo's taint. I wanted to hit driver off the deck to take advantage of the fact that there was no grass on the fairway. I knew that I could get some roll. Ernesto disagreed. He wanted the stinger off the deck, but I argued against it. We had a very long discussion about it. I told him that under pressure, it's always best to hit the shot you're most comfortable with. So I insisted that he stick with the double cross. The, uh, the fairway's 70 yards wide. So, you know, I still to this day don't know what those two were doing, deliberating the tee shot for as long as they did. Um, the, the groups behind us were starting to back up. And uh, the, the fairway there is, is pure hard pan, so any club in the bag would have worked just fine. Uh, I, I thought the whole thing was ridiculous. You know, after a lengthy discussion, I allowed Ernesto to overrule me. That's the first time I've ever let a caddy do that, and it cost me. <laughs> you know, I, I play a lot of golf, and uh, to this day, I have never seen a guy hit a tee shot that far right. In what some have called the worst tee shot in the history of the Mexican mini tour, CPG blocked one so far right that some say it actually cleared the border wall protecting the U.S.-Mexican border, landing in what was technically Brownsville, Texas. He lost it a little right. It was my fault. You know, looking back, I, I let the sirens from that ambulance rushing to assist that kid bother me. I've always had a case of rabbit ears. I should have backed off the shot, but I didn't, and that's on me. We had looked very hard for the ball. We found a group of Border Patrol agents. They thought they might have heard something. They helped us look for many minutes, but it was no use. It was no use. CPG is like yelling at me to stop talking to Hans and help him find his ball. And I'm like, do you have a ladder? Because that ball cleared that fence border thingy. I I'm laughing because everybody seems to forget that this is a four ball event. So uh, I'm 86 yards from the flag uh, in the middle of the fairway. And these two are running around looking for a ball that is long gone. We couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. In a desperate and almost pathetic attempt to keep the streak alive, CPG took a lost ball penalty and went back to the tee hoping for a miracle. But it was no use. The streak was over. In the end, El Chapo's taint claimed yet another victim I can't believe it's been 20 years now. I look back at it with great pride. It was that rare combination of a special player 
with a special talent, coming together at a special time to create something amazing. I was blessed to be a part of it. Uh, can someone tell me what this documentary is exactly about? Um, I'm a little bit, uh, quite frankly, I'm a little confused. Joe DiMaggio, Cal Ripken, Byron Nelson, and Club Pro Guy. It's got a pretty good ring to it. A pretty good ring to it.